Stanley. Yesterday evening I finished with my imaginary boyfriend. He knew what I was going to say before I said it, which was top of my list of reasons why we should end it. My other reasons were as follows. He always does exactly what I tell him. Nothing in our relationship has ever surprised me. He has no second name. He took it very well, all things considered. He told me I was to think of him as a friend, and if I ever need him, I know where he is. As well as an imaginary boyfriend, I have an imaginary friend, um, Jessica Elton, and she's got a series of poems in this book, so I'm going to read three of those. Suntan. The last time Jessica Elton had a suntan, she was 11 years old. Over the summer holidays, her mother would lock her out of the house after her cornflakes and wouldn't let her back in until her father got home. Jessica then spent the next six weeks with red-headed Ian Morrison, playing ball girl to his Boris Becker, assistant to his Doctor Who, victim to his jaws at the swimming pool. When she turned 12, Jessica discovered the beanbags at the public library and Victorian novels. For three days, Ian stood baffled outside the window of the children's section, a sudden orphan turning a dangerous shade of pink. And this one takes its title from the Nokia instruction manual. Section 3, write text, page 22. Jessica Elton is learning how to text predictively. She is also trying to work out what sort of person these words have been predicted for. A teenager, but why book before call? Trader, money comes straight up, as do shares, but why sub before pub? Perhaps venture capitalists rate football above alcohol. However, Jessica's phone refuses to swear, and who on earth wants a nun before their mum? Jessica Elton is puzzled, but she does know that when she exits the underground and her phone beeps to inform her that a new message has been received, her bag seems to become heavier. <laughs> London Light. Some evenings, Jessica Elton feels she has been washed home on a tide of free newspapers. Getting on the tube after rush hour, the carriage is strewn with actresses falling out of cars or relationships. The reporters would have Jessica believe that these women are drowning, but how could they with those legs? I thought I'd um, read this next poem set in an art gallery because we're in an art gallery. Dan's Le Cabinet de Toilette, 1907. I'm looking at one of Bonnard's standing nudes, thinking again how much I like his paintings, when my companion for the exhibition returns to my side, having finished already, not feeling compelled to read every single caption and asks me, why is she wearing a pair of high-heeled shoes in the bathroom? It's true, she's wearing court shoes, which I hadn't noticed. She's naked, drying herself with a luminous towel, wearing sunset-coloured shoes, and we find another Bonnard nude on another wall, where she's wearing what could be black slippers, but why would they be pointed? This caption says it's his wife, and I remember reading in a catalogue about Bonnard's wife being obsessed with cleanliness, how she was always washing herself. So Bonnard was always painting her naked in the bathroom, but she must have had issues about the soles of her feet touching floor tiles. My date has no such problem. He tells me he loves going barefoot, and he couldn't own these paintings. Those shoes are making him uncomfortable, and I like Bonnard even more for letting his wife keep her shoes on and for painting them there. Um, this next poem um, reimagines the story of Beauty and the Beast, and it's called My Beast. 
When I was a child, I worried that when I got my chance to love a beast, I would not be up to the task. As he came in for the kiss, I'd turn away or gag on the mane in my mouth. But now I see that the last thing my father, driving home late from work, would have on his mind is the gardens flashing by, and he would never stop to pick a rose for one of his daughters. And if some misfortune, such as his Volvo, reversing into a beast's carriage did occur, and I ended up at the castle as compensation, the beast would probably just set me to work cleaning, and I'd never look up from scrubbing a floor and catch him in the doorway, admiring my technique. Still, as I've heard my dad say, he and his children may not always be brilliant, but we always turn up. And in time, when the beast comes to realise that I haven't tried to escape, he'll give me leave one Sunday a month to visit my family and access to his vast library. And in bed at night, reading by the light of a candle, I'll shut another calf-bound volume and listen to its quality thud with something like happiness. Um, this poem was called Second Wives, and um, I had in mind literary second wives um, like Jane Eyre and the second Mrs. De Winter and Rebecca, but I was also thinking of poets' second wives like Ted Hughes and T.S. Eliot. Second Wives. Your love did not find us vertical and rotating around a dance hall or chaperoned on an afternoon lawn, pretending to read. We earned it like our money, angled over desks, over your children, comforted you down corridors. And if you never tore an evening dress we wore, you never had to bolt the door against us, while we accepted you maimed, the family seat raised to the ground, that book you kept with grass-stained pages. And um, this is my last poem, and it's called Poetry Dreams. Some nights I dream about poetry, not in poetry, which my friend thought I meant, the characters speaking in verse, declaiming heroic couplets, which is maybe how you dream if you happen to be Milton, but rather what I would term poetry activities. In one dream, I came forth in a poetry competition, and in another, I was at a reading by an up-and-coming poet who accompanied each poem with a dance routine. I did once have a good poetry dream, the one where I went into a country pub, and there at a table were all the great women poets. They didn't invite me to join them, but ordering my pint at the bar, I got the impression one of them knew who I was, and in this dream, I remember thinking that that was something, that this was a start. Thank you.